I'm amazed at the Holy Spirit because he just sets everything up. And uh, so he's talking about hunger during prayer. Are you, are you hungering for the things of God? Are you just coming to church, going through the motion, checking off the box? Are you living daily just going through, you know, the same um, mundane routine every day? Are you hungry for the things of God? You know, Matthew 5 says, blessed are those who are hunger for I, hungry and thirsty. I will fill them, right? So there's a part that we have to play in being hungry for the things of God. Hallelujah. It's like a marriage covenant. Right? When you're dating, you're hungry. What I mean, there's passion, there's pursuit. There's certain scents in your car. There's certain doors that get open. There's certain ma uh, meals that get paid for, hopefully by the man. Right? There's a pursuit. There's a chase. There's a desire. There's a burning on the inside. I mean, you fall asleep uh, on the phone with one another. Or texting. I don't know whatever y'all do these days, but for those that are single, thank God I'm married. <laughs> I tell you, it's, it's different today. Let me see your birth certificate. <laughs> you were born. Okay. Hallelujah. Selah. But you fall asleep on the phone, right? There's a passion. You can't wait to talk to that person. How much more for the things of God? But just like in a marriage, guess what? After 15 years, 20 years, is the passion still there? Or do you have the hunter mentality like a man? You know, I, I got my, my prize and I mounted it and put it on my wall. It's like the picture you never look at anymore that used to be fresh to you in your, in your house, right? But the relation in God, man, are you still going after God? Are you hungry? So Matt, Pastor Marcus really stirred us up to prayer. And I, for those that weren't at corporate prayer, it's a powerful time. I would uh, really encourage you to be here, man. I mean, uh, words of life, the Holy Ghost is moving. Things are being declared. Things are being prayed. Things are being supplicated, interceded for. And it's a time for us to connect. Thank God for individual prayer. But corporately, we could do a lot in unity and also get a lot of direction for our lives and the, and the mission and the vision of this church. Amen. And so are you hungry for God? But then I knew where I was going today. Todd, after I gave him the title, knew where I was going today. My wife, I filled her in last night of what the Holy Ghost put in me because I'm on assignment, just not on opportunity. I already knew in my heart last Sunday because it started brewing, marinating. And then when pastor said, hey, I need you to minister, pastor prays about who's supposed to be in the pulpit when he's out. And so this is an assignment. And it's amazing that Audrey had a word. I said, well, let me, let me find out what it is. And it went right along with the message. No dialogue, no pre-conversation. She had no idea where we're going. Lines up exactly with what I'm going to speak about this morning. That's the Holy Ghost in operation. Aren't you thankful for the Holy Ghost? So in Luke chapter 17, you know, the, the disciples, they know, the Jewish community knows, man, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? It's the anointed king. They've been looking for a king to rule their nation from that time in the Old Testament to the current, right? Basically, from the book of Samuel all the way up, they've been looking for a king to rule. Saul was the first king over Israel in the Old Testament. We find that in 1 Samuel. But the, the whole nation of Israel is looking for this anointed king. And they're saying, Jesus, when is your kingdom going to come? And Jesus says in Luke chapter 17, in response to them, verse number 20, he said, now, uh, when he was asked by the Pharisees, when will the kingdom, the Basilea, the realm or the territory where, where a king is in charge, would come? Now, there's two terms in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of uh, God. Do you stop and think about that? The kingdom of heaven, the word of heaven is arenos. It's the third heaven where God dwells, where his throne's at. He said the kingdom of heaven, my, the way that my rule is in heaven, I want it to be done on earth. We know the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. He's saying, I want righteousness. I want peace. I want joy in the Holy Ghost on the earth. But in this verse, when he responds to the disciples who are asking, when is the Messiah coming? He said the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of heaven. He said, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, everybody say kingdom of God, kingdom of God. say kingdom of, kingdom of heaven. 
In this verse, Jesus says the kingdom of God. Now, God is theos, just God, uh, the Father, right? It doesn't come with observation. Uh, they'll, it, it, you don't say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is where? Where is it at? It's inside you. Now. Now. His rule, his realm, his territory, his relationship is with you when? Now. Someday we'll be in the kingdom of heaven, but right now we get to operate in the kingdom of God. Are you with me this morning? Yes. Say, I'm listening. I'm listening. Say, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Say, God, give me more. God, more. Give me more. In John chapter 3, we all know verse number 16, right? For God so what? Loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Let me ask you this. What's attractive about your life? What draws people to you? In the kingdom of God, Jesus said we're to occupy till he comes. That means your influence and your presence should be felt everywhere. When you leave the house in the morning, something should be void because you're gone. When you come home, something should be added. Once again, if you're married and you come home and your wife wants you to leave again, that's a problem. That's not kingdom principles or kingdom living. No, he's home, right? Your kids, oh, daddy's home. At church, if you're gone, do we miss you? You like Nicodemus? Let's read John chapter 3. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees, starting at verse number 1, named Nicodemus, a rule of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, so he secretly came in. But he was drawn to who? The king. This is a man that is well-versed and well-educated in uh, the Jewish religion, but man, there was something about Jesus. What is it about you that attracts people? It's not the external qualities. It's the internal love and this life that you're living out for him that draws. We should all draw. Pastor Marcus said this during prayer. He said, man, I work for the church full time. Him and I ran together, enterprise, <laughs> rent a car. Hallelujah. Thank God for deliverance. <laughs> we were both branch managers before we came on with the church, and that was an interesting uh, time. Learned a lot of things. Wouldn't change anything. You know, you learn uh, a lot of things as you go in life. Uh, but he's been with the church for some time now, and he said, man, it's good to get out in the world and be a light and be salt. He said, I'm around believers all the time. So it's good, good to get out of there. And he was just talking about praying for people, you know. And he said, don't be weird about it, but we need to pray for people. Hey, could you use some prayer? Some people say no, but at least you let them know the kingdom has arrived. And God was here for you on this certain date at this certain time. And your hand extending is like God's hand extending. He said, don't be weird. He gave an example of his mom. You know, she would just gently, gently grab your hand and said, hey, can I pray for you? They said, yes, she would just connect with them. There's something about connecting with people. Now he said, don't go up there and say, oh, the spirit of the Lord said. <laughs> so let's read on. So Nicodemus, a rule of Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, what attracts people to you? We know that you are a teacher come from God. So he didn't know him as Lord. He knew him as teacher, instructor, communicator, right? He said, no one can do these signs that you do, Jesus, unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom, the basilea of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born Again, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So everyone who is born of the Spirit, Nicodemus said, answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things? Man, he's saying, listen, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you have to be born of God to understand the kingdom of God. And the reason I bring up this verse is just like you were born naturally, it was a point in time. And when you're born again spiritually, it's a point in time. But it's just the beginning, not the end. My journey with the Lord Jesus Christ started in 1997. That's my moment in time. And guess what? There's just something on the inside of hunger then, more of a hunger now to go on with God. I'm talking to you about finishing your race today. There's a purpose. There's an assignment. There's a plan. God is intentional. He never reacts. He responds. And my, my, my journey started in 1997 in Columbus, the great state of Ohio. OH. All right, got some fans in here. And I was, I, was, I was doing my own thing. I was part of the world. Like I said, I went to church when I was young, but I had no relationship with Jesus, did not know the word of God, had no idea the wonderful truths and promises contained in the word of God, and just running my race. I run my course with the world. You know, I had a great friend in high school, Steve Miller. Actually, his dad was a Quaker state sales, uh, Quaker oil, Quaker, yeah, Quaker state, Quaker state, yeah, Quaker state oil. Is that the name of it? Sorry. We were watching Spider-Man and I, I'm all confused now. <laughs> Last night, my wife was laughing at me. I, I said, Dr. Octopus, but it's not, it's Doc Ock, yeah. Anyways, Quaker state is right. <laughs> She laughed at me. Praise the Lord. So he was a Quaker State oil salesman, and uh, they had to move from Florida, which is interesting. He's from Florida. I'm in Florida now. Uh, they moved to, to Ohio. His dad got transferred up there. And so, you know, he was athletic. I was athletic. Um, I like lifting weights. He liked lifting weights. We, we partied hard. We ran hard. And all of a sudden, he started going to church. And it was, it was weird for me because he starts talking about the things of God. And I'm like, this dude's crazy, man. You know, so I, I mean, he was calling me like nonstop. I, I'm dodging his phone calls, you know, not, not returning things. And, but he was relentless, relentless. He just, thank God he never gave up on me. And during that time I was real confused. You know, I didn't know where I was going. I, um, you know, it's, it's the cup with holes in it. And what I mean by that, when you have a cup with holes in it, no matter what you pour in the cup, it's not enough. And so I'm chasing all these things, but I'm never satisfied. You know, lust is insatiable. Lust is never satisfied. Love is easily satisfied. And so, man, he's, he's calling me. At the same time, I'm working as a college temp at Worthington Steel. And there's a guy there named Brian, and he knows I like Lyft. And so he starts talking to me about, oh, you, you like Lyft and uh, do you know about some nutrition stuff? And starts talking about herbs and, you know, different stuff. And I'm like, what, what is this guy doing? You know, I mean, all he was doing, though, he's a believer, and he's just trying to find an inroad in, in yeah. to connect. And he finally started connecting. Yeah. I mean, gracefully, you know, day after day when I'm at work, he's, and I'm sure he's probably praying for me, right? And he's a laborer across my path. So between Steve and Brian, I finally surrendered my life to the Lord yeah. and found a great church uh, at, at Rama Christian Center with Apostle Scales, who we have come to the Kingdom Rise Conference and um, man, um, I remember I just sitting in services there in Columbus, Ohio, man, and just so hungry for the things of God, taking notes. I got my index card with scriptures on my dash, you know. We had tape players at the time jamming out to Ron Cannoli. Yes. Hallelujah, ancient of days, I see the Lord. Come on, right? And just going on with God. And that's where I started my race. But guess what? It was just the start. Just the same way that you're, you're born in the natural and there's a whole life to live. You're born again supernaturally. There's a whole life to live in the kingdom of God for the rest of your life. The question is, are you going to finish your race? Are you going to finish your race? Luke chapter 17, verse number one. I'm going to read Luke 17, 1 through 5 in the New King James Version. Then I'm going to uh, give two more different translations just for verse 1 after that. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He said to his disciples, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. 
Now, if Jesus says it's impossible, what's that mean? It's impossible. That no offenses should come. But woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed. Say, take heed. heed. You know what take heed means? It means pay attention, be observant, be on watch. In Genesis chapter 1, we see the creation of the earth, the heavens. We see the creation of man. Then God takes man. He puts him in the garden. God never intended for Adam to really come to the heavens. His assignment was on the earth. Why do you think we look for the fountain of life? Because there's something within mankind that doesn't want to die. It's, it's, death is unnatural, I could put it that way. But when sin entered because man disobeyed, death passed all men. And so let's, let's read on. Take heed. Adam, when God put Adam in the garden, he said, I want you to watch it and to keep it. Jesus is really reiterating the same commandment. You know, God doesn't give suggestions or invitations. It's not like a birthday party where I say, hey, I invite you. You can either, you know, accept it or decline it. No, and with the commandment, you either obey it or disobey it. And the disobedience, the consequences of disobedience could last for a lifetime. It's better to obey because God knows the best plan for your life, the best way for your life. Man, he'll be so good to you if you're so good to him. And obedience says, man, I want to be faithful to you, Lord. So Jesus says, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you or does you wrong, right, rebuke him. And if he repents, you know, it says if your brother sins against you, don't go post it on Facebook. Right? Go put on social media. It says, what? You go to him. I know some of us don't like conflict. Some are a little um, more introverted. Some, some are too extroverted, right? I just got to say what's on my mind. Well, you need to come and bounce on the other side, right? Uh, but man, if somebody does you wrong, the Bible says to go to them, right? If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Look at the disciples' answer. Lord, what did they say? Increase our faith. They're like, are you serious? If, if somebody repetitively keeps doing me wrong, I'm just supposed to forgive them? And they said, okay, increase our faith. The J.B. Phillips says it this way. Jesus said to the disciples, it's inevitable that there should be pitfalls, but alas for the man who's responsible for them. The Message Bible reads it this way. He said to his disciples, hard trials and temptations are bound to come, but too bad for whoever brings them on. So there is a a plan that God has for you. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. The NIV says, I know the thoughts or the plans that I have for you, right? Plans to uh, prosper you and not to harm you. Plans for hope and for a future. But in the middle of those plans that God has for you, guess what? There's going to be hindrances in your race. There's going to be difficulties during your course on earth. There's going to be roadblocks in your assignment. But the question is, are you going to overcome those things and finish your course? Paul said in Philippians chapter one, verse number six, he that began a good work in you, he will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. But are you going to keep on cooperating with Jesus to finish the course? Are you going to be one of those? We're going to see some hindrances here in a little bit uh, that get hindered or offended at something and it stops you dead in your tracks. I've seen it, church. I've seen people that are on fire for God. And because of an offense, it just stops their progress. The Apostle Paul, what a great example from the uh, New Testament. Obviously, he wrote a large portion of of the New Testament. You know, he was born in 5 AD, got converted about 34 AD. You know, he was, he was a Jewish uh, disciple, really. He persecuted the church. I mean, to the point of killing the martyr Stephen. And then he had a conversion over in Acts chapter uh, 9. And man, at about 34 AD, he gave his life to the Lord. And that was just a starting point, his spiritual birth. And man, he ran hard for about 34 to 36 years of his life until he was martyred in about 64 to 66 AD. 
But what an example, what a picture for us. Are you going to go on with God and finish the course that he has for you? Listen to what Paul said in his last letter that he wrote while he was on the earth. You can find it in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. It says this, for I am already being poured out. So this is Paul at the end of his life, at the end of his assignment. Listen, and he's completing the destiny that God had for me on the earth. And we all want to have this testimony before we draw our last breath. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to also to all those who love his appearing. The J.B. Phillips says it this way. As for me, I feel that the last drops of my life are being poured out for God. The glorious, the glorious fight that God gave me, I have fought. The course that I was set, I have finished. I have kept the faith. The future for me holds the crown of righteousness, which God, the true judge, will give to those who uh, loved uh, uh, what they have seen of him. The Living Bible says it like this. I say this because I won't be around to help you very much longer. My time has almost run out. You know that God will reveal things to you as you're close with him. He knew that he was going to be killed as a martyr. Listen to his language. Uh, My time's almost out. Very soon now I'll be on my way to heaven. I fought long and hard for my Lord. And uh, through it all, I've kept true to him. What a statement. Through it all. Through it all, I've kept true to him. And now the time has come for me to stop fighting and rest. In heaven, a crown is waiting for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that great day of his return. And not just to me, but to all those whose lives show they are eagerly looking forward to his coming back again. Paul made other statements in his epistles like this. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Verses 24 through 27 from the Message Bible says, you've all been to the stadium. You've seen the athlete, athletes race. Everyone runs, one wins. Run to win. Run to win. All good athletes train hard. They do it for a gold medal that tarnishes and fades. You're after one that's gold eternally. We all have our own lane. We all have our own assignments. All of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. Each of you is unique in this room. No fingerprint is the same, and God knows you, and God knows what he has planned for you. And Paul's saying in Corinthians, run your race. He's relating the physical with the natural, man. And Olympic athletes, guess what? There is discipline. There's regiment. There's perseverance. There's passion, right? And all these things, he's saying, what you do in the natural to accomplish these things, transfer it to the spiritual because it's of way more value value. Go after the gold eternally. I don't know about you, but I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm running hard for the finish line. I'm giving it everything I got. No lazy living for me. I'm staying alert and in top condition. It's interesting every January with New Year's resolutions. Right? These great goals. A lot of them physically. Gym memberships soar. And so does attendance until February 1st. (laughs) Right? It's not about just starting. It's about finishing. There's more to maintaining than there is to obtaining. He said, no lazy limb for me. I'm staying alert in top condition. I'm not going to get caught napping, telling everyone else about uh, all about it and then missing out myself. Listen to what the author of Hebrew says in uh, chapter 12, verses one through two. He says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness, strip off every unnecessary weight. This is what Audrey got up by the Spirit and said, there's hindrances. Strip them off. And the sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us, let us run with endurance. Let us run with endurance. Let us run with, you know, sometimes in a race you get tired. 
Sometimes you get weary. I like what the prophecy said from 1 Corinthians 12 is what Audrey did. She had an inspiration by the Spirit. There's nine uh, uh, gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12. She had unction in her spirit. That man, in those times uh, that you feel weary, that you feel down, you could reach out. This is a family. We're part of the family of God, operating in the kingdom of God. And listen, just the same way in the natural. You know, I lift with LG sometimes, and man, uh, he may get stuck on a lift. I and I just tap that bar just a little bit, and it pushes him through. Well, this is spiritual spotting with our church family. Sometimes you may be tired, you may be weary, you may be down. All you need to do is come to church on a Wednesday or a Sunday or call one of your Christian friends. Don't call a non-Christian person. There's a big difference between uh, good advice and godly counsel. And man, they'll give you a word that'll just push you through. And you know what? You come out stronger on the other side. So strip off the weights and run with endurance and act of persistence the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will just distract. Are you focused? Are you focused? Focus your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the first incentive for our belief in the one who brings out faith to maturity, who for joy of accomplishing the goal, set before him, endured the cross, disregarding the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and his completion of his work. I want to, as a case study today, look at David and Saul as an example of races in life. But before, before we get there, I want to go to Judges chapter 3 quickly. Judges chapter 3. You know, in Genesis chapter 12, uh, a nation is born with Abraham. God finds a covenant man. And guess what? Uh, just like we're born again and start a work, he found Abraham, a man that was going to love him, be hungry for him. He said, I got an assignment for you on the earth, Abraham, just like he has an assignment for us on the earth. And so a nation is born, right? But that nation becomes enslaved. So in Exodus, uh, we see another man that God raised up for work on the earth called Moses. He became the deliverer of the nation, right? In Leviticus, we see the sanctification of a nation. People set apart. If you're going to go on with your, your walk and your journey with God, you need to be set apart and dedicated just like an Olympic athlete. In Numbers, we see the journeys of a nation. And this is not a sprint. This is a journey. There's going to be times where things are accelerated. There's going to be times where you feel like you're walking. There may be times when you feel like you're crawling, but just keep moving forward. The Bible says a righteous man may fall down. So if you fall, fall forward, not backwards and get back up, shake the dust off your feet and not to be too secular, but it reminds me of Rocky Balboa getting knocked down as Mick as Cornerman saying, get up, you bum. It ain't over. Now, God ain't going to call you a bum, but he's going to tell you to get back up. And in Deuteronomy, we see the instructions of a nation. But in Joshua, we see the possession of a nation. This is where God takes his covenant people and brings them into the promised land. Now, guess what? In the promised land, it's not heaven. There's actually enemies and giants in the promised land. And there's a fight that they have to fight. Just like Paul said, I fight the good fight of faith. And some people were so warped in their perception. They said, I'm like, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. But oh, if there's a Joshua, if there's a Caleb in the house that said, we're well able to take this land. But Judges is interesting because it really opens up your perspective to why God leaves enemies in the land. Judges chapter three, verses one through two from the New Living Translation says, these are the nations that God left in the land to test those Israelites who had not experienced the wars of Canaan. So some of the generation never experienced how to fight. And man, I don't want a, a, a wimpy-fied, sissy-fied group of people. You got to learn how to fight the good fight of faith, right? There's been generations that we talked about in the past. We talked about Smith Wigglesworth. We talked about Kenneth Hagin. I can name a lot of other great men and women of God that went on. But it's our time down here. They learn how to fight the good fight of faith. They learn how to be led by the Spirit. They did great miracles for God. They finished their course. But it's our time to learn how to fight. Thank God for their stories. But when are you going to create your testimony and your story for God? He did not teach this uh, warfare to generations of Israelites who had no experience in battle. So he left some enemies in the land on purpose to teach them how to fight the good fight of faith. Psalms 34, 19 said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers, delivers us out of all of them. 
Not some of them. Many are the afflictions. So we get to the life of David. He comes on the scene in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. Samuel, the first uh, prophet, well, in the book of Samuel, and he, he took the horn of oil because God gave Samuel an assignment. Samuel an assignment. God told Samuel, go to Jesse's house. I'm going to anoint a new king for Israel. And so Samuel went to Jesse's house. He found, finally found David after all the other sons passed by. And God said, this is the man. And you know what? Samuel was looking at all the outward things. And God said, don't look after the outward appearance. I look on the heart. And one thing about David's life, he was always hungry for God. Even if he, even if he blew it, he was quick to get it right and take responsibility. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. The spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit troubled him. David was anointed for service. You got to know you're, you got to know that you're anointed for your purpose. It's not just through your own strength and through your own effort. It's with the Holy Spirit. We're doing this with the Holy Ghost. And David said, man, I need the Spirit of God. Even when David failed with Bathsheba and committed adultery, Psalms 51, hear his cry when he's asking God for repentance. In Psalms 51, uh, 10, verse, uh, through verse 12, it says, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David said, I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I was wrong in what I did. Never did that sin again. But man, he, he did something Saul didn't do, which was ask for forgiveness. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 34 through 37, we get a glimpse into David's life on some battles that he went through. Say there's going to be some battles. There's going to be some difficulties. Say it. There's going to be some difficulties. There's going to be some tests. There's going to be some trials. But I'm going to overcome and I'm going to finish. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. So this is David when he's getting ready to take on Goliath. He's given his resume to King Saul. He said, when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it. And I struck it and I delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by the beard, struck it and killed it. Your servants killed both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of those. Seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. So David overcame some things. There was a lion that came. There was a bear that came, right? And a lion represents the devil. First Peter chapter five, verses eight through nine. He said, I overcame the lion. It said in first Peter five, verses eight through nine, it says, be alert and of sober mind, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So he's going around everywhere right now looking for what? Some are to devour. The Bible says resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Then he overcame the bear, which is the world's system. It's the way that the world does things. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, you know, there's a way, there's a course of the world the Bible talks about in Ephesians. There's a way that the world goes about doing things. But the kingdom of God doesn't always operate like the world, Right? I recently met with an individual from Comcast who does effective communication, and he was trying to sell us uh, advertisements through streaming, cable, uh, direct media, or direct um, on-demand, uh, different, there's a bunch of different ones out there, I don't know what they all mean. But um, he had a breakdown of every age group from 18 to like 80. And who watched what? So like, it was amazing. Some that were like 56 and on are doing like 56 hours of cable TV a week. That's the way that the world does things. You know, when you watch all the world's programs, guess who's programming you? The world. 
but are we people of the word? So David overcame the devil. He overcame the world system. We're not to be conformed to this world, Romans 12 says us, but we're, Romans 12 says, but we're to be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Well, you're brainwashing people. Well, people need their brains washed. There's a lot of filth up there. I know when I was pre-Christ, there was a lot of junk up there. And thank God for the washing of the water of the word. Truth liberates. Truth sets free. Truth gives, truth gives you clarity. Psalm says his word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I don't have to be confused or disorganized or live in chaos when I have truth in my life. John chapter 16, verses 15 through 17 Jesus said this, I do not pray that you, you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. So King David understood, man, I dealt with the, the enemy, the devil. I dealt with the world system. And just because we're in the world, we're not of the world. Jesus went on to say, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Second Corinthians chapter four Verses three through four says this, but even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. The God of this age is the devil who is controlling the world system. His ideologies, his philosophy, his antichrist stance, right? He's the God of this world, but when we preach the gospel, we get a chance to liberate those who are of the world's way of thinking and see true deliverance and greatness come to pass. So David, these were hindrances. He had to overcome the devil. He had to over overcome the world system. But then he faces Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And what's Goliath? Goliath is a big community problem. I mean, he's taunting the community, right? And what is it in St. Augustine? What is it in Florida? What is it in this nation that's trying to taunt us I'll put it this way. Goliath was trying to intimidate. You know, the world's trying to get you quiet. You could say the big buddy upstairs. You could pray in the name of Muhammad. But they want to shut you down when you say in Jesus name. They want to intimidate you and silence you and keep you quiet and try to put you in a corner somewhere. You know, the disciples are not like that in the book of Acts. Man, they got out with the kingdom mandate and they said, they're going to fill our presence to see our light. Yes. What attracts people to you that allows them to see your light, right? And to, and to taste your salt. The Bible says you're the light of the earth. You're the salt of the world, right? And so we need to be bold, yes. bold. Yes. Proverbs said the righteous are as bold as a lion, but the wicked flee when no man's pursues. I love going down to the county and praying. Every once in a while, I get the assignment of the invocation down there. Pastor Earl, I think, just did it last Tuesday. I have another one coming up, but I get to pray in the name of Jesus. Right? So it's exciting to be in that environment, which is not all truth, and to be able to speak truth in that environment. So what is the community problems? Pornography is a problem. What are we doing to bring deliverance, Right? Uh, substance abuse is a problem. So we got we to gotta be able to reach out. Homelessness is a problem. So we overcome the, the lion, right? The devil. We overcome the world system and we deal with community issues in our nation. Some of that's through prayer and corporate prayer. Some of that's being vocal when God says you need to get out and be around. But you know, I think the toughest test for David was Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel. And man, he began with a purpose from God, with an assignment from God. But man, he did not finish. And that's what, as a pastor, is the most grieving thing is they see somebody start, but then trail off because of these hindrances. The devil tricks them. The world system pulls them in. The community problem overtakes them, right? And Saul got off. He was rejected as king, and that's why David was anointed as king. Saul became offended. Saul became offended. Proverbs 18, 19 says this, 
A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. Why did Saul, why did God, why did Saul get offended? Let's look in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 5 through 9. So David went out wherever Saul sent him. So David is under the command of Saul, the king. But yet, David's already anointed at this time, knows he's going to be king, but yet he's serving the king who's already been rejected. Think about that. He, he's not where he's supposed to be, but serving the man who's been rejected in the position he's going to be in. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted. David was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of all of Saul's servants. So there was a great respect and reverence for King David. Now, it happened as they were coming home when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistine that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. So the women, the women sang and they danced. They said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed David ten thousands, and to me they've only ascribed thousands. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? So Saul eyed David from that day forward. You know, we are to celebrate other successes, not become envious and jealous of what others are doing. The Bible says to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And man, when somebody is doing something for the kingdom as a family in the kingdom of God, we should celebrate for the great exploits they're doing. But instead, Saul became jealous. He became offended. Did you know that between 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse number 11, through 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse number 11, Saul tried to kill David six different times. Try to throw a javelin at him one time, used different means and methods, manipulated his daughter to marry him so that he could be in the army and, and get around the Philistines so the Philistines could try to kill him. I mean, he was plotting and scheming, how am I going to take this guy? But can you imagine how David felt? Can you imagine the person that was supposed to be his mentor became his attempted murderer? Can you imagine the offense that David could have held against him? You know, there's three periods of David's life. One, preparation when he's in the unseen. Nobody knows him. Nobody knows his name. But he's just being faithful to his father, Jesse. He's just tending the sheep, taking care of the flock. But in those private times, guess what? Strength's being built. Faith's being built. Learning how to hear the voice of God. Operating with the Spirit, right? And guess what? There's private victories that are taking place that publicly nobody knows about. So don't despise a day of small beginnings, Zechariah 4.10 says. God loves to see the work begun. And I know in the world, everybody wants their name on the marquee, wants to be seen. But in the kingdom, the greatest is servant of all. And you can only perform in public to the degree you're willing to practice in private. I was telling recently in some of our marriage counseling, even with the Mighty Men on Monday nights, it, it's a tragedy if you bring your kids to church and you don't live it out at the house. It's confusing. If you don't do devotionals with them, pray with them, talk about the things of God, if the spouses are in conflict, and conflict's normal, Right? Right? <laughs> Is conflict normal? Yeah. All right. How many husbands and wives never had a fight? Oh, you're a liar. There's an altar right here. I saw that hand. <laughs> saw that hand. Your nose is growing over there. <laughs> but it's confusing, man. If if you're talking about the things of God then you're, and you go home and you're just like the world and all these um, obscenities are coming out of your mouth, you're just, you know, feeding on ACDC or whatever your 
prior BC flavor of music was, right? Uh, was. You know, I was so confused in high school, I didn't know what I was. I mean, I knew I was a man. <laughs> but as far as I went through my country phase, Matter of fact, I was having a, a conversation with my son Jacob one time about country. He's like, nah, that ain't true, Dad. I say, yeah, you, you listen to country, you're going to put on a hat. You're going to wear the boots. <laughs> no, that's not true. I said, people that listen to rap aren't putting on hats and wearing cowboy boots, right? But then I went through on a rap stage. Guess what? My wardrobe changed. <laughs> you know, it's expensive not to serve God. <laughs> I went through my rock stage, right? But, oh, I found Jesus. I'm in my place. I'm in my position. I'm well satisfied. Hallelujah. But, man, we got to live it out the house. So if you got to practice in private. Don't despise small beginnings. Man, God's, God's he's, he's faithful, and he knows what he's doing. He's not going to put more on you than what you can handle. If you can't bench 100 pounds, he's not going to say, here, try 200. Let's just break your sternum. Right? No, he's going to gradually, as you're serving him, uh, build you up in the things of God so you can handle more. He who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. He'll increase your capacity. But you got to keep on serving and going after him, right? So you can imagine David, man, with Saul trying to kill him. Uh, He's in a preparation phase. But this becomes his wilderness, Or is running. You know, the second phase of his life, he's on the run from the person that's supposed to be investing into him, pouring into him. He's on the run as a fugitive from them. And you know, it's interesting. God places Saul twice, and we're going to read both accounts, in a position where David could have brought vengeance upon him. First accounts, 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 through 7. So think about the anger. Think about the rage. Think about the disappointment. I mean, think about the things that are welling up in David's heart thinking, man, what did I do to deserve this? Why is Saul trying to kill me? What is going on? I'm on the run. I'm away from my my home, uh, my community, what's familiar. I'm living in caves, right? But God's still working through David all that whole time. David gets in a cave with 400 men at the cave of Adullam in 1 Samuel 22. And guess what? God says, I'm not done with you yet. Even though you're on the run, you're on the right track. Don't get weary and well-doing for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And so David gets a chance to start reproducing himself in people that are in distress, debt, and discontented. That's what 1 Samuel 22 said is God assigned him 400 men that were in debt, 400 men that were in distress, and he's already distressed and discontented, and guess what? They become the mighty men of the Bible because they got around a mighty man. What is your influence in impacting? What is your life speaking to, right? And so 1 Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 7, it happened when Saul had returned from following the Philistines that he was told, saying, take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all of Israel and went to seek David. So he's already tried to kill him six times. David's on the run now. And Saul's still going after him. And Saul went. Um, then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel, went to seek David, his men, and, and all um, on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road. Uh, where there was a cave, Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were uh, staying in the recesses or in the back of the cave. So Saul didn't know they were in the cave when he went to relieve himself. Then the men of David said to him, this is the day which the Lord said to you, behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Saul didn't even know what took place. David could have struck him down right there and said, this man's done me wrong. And he deserves death. He tried to kill me six times, and now he's going to reap what he sowed. David cut off a piece of his robe. It happened afterward that David's heart troubled him or it pierced him because he had cut off Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master. The Lord, uh, the Lord anointed to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the, uh, the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants 
with these words, and they did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul got away from the cave and went his way. An opportunity to kill somebody that was doing him wrong. And his, it so struck his heart that he even cut the robe. His heart stayed tender towards God. The second time, so Saul didn't even know, right? The second time is found in 1 Samuel chapter 26, verses 8 through 11. And once again, Saul is told the location where David is at. So uh, Saul's uh, chasing after David. Uh, his military men come with him. They're asleep in the middle of the night. And you know, they had a circle around him to protect Saul as a king. But his military advisors and people were around Saul to protect him. Uh, but then uh, David saw him in, the, in this place at night. And one of David's servants in verse 8 said, uh, Abishah said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him. I'll kill him with my spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishah, do not destroy him. Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out the hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, now listen to this, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him. Or his day shall come to die. He shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and jug of water there by our head and let us go. And they took that jug of water and that spear and they got to a, a place that was some distance. They cried out to Saul. Saul realized at that point because they took the jug and the spear that he could have killed him then, but showed compassion to him. And David is like, why are you still chasing me? Why, church, our offense is still chasing you? So David overcame the lion and the bear with his hands. He overcame Goliath with a sling, but he overcame Saul with compassion. What do you have to overcome with compassion to continue your race with God? What are you going to do to finish strong? You got to be a person that walks in love. You got to be a person that walks with compassion. Jesus, when he saw the multitude scattered, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. They're like sheep without a shepherd. Listen, your fight's not against people. Let me help you out this week when somebody's being difficult, abrasive, just plain out rude and mean and ugly. Your fight's not with them. The Bible says in Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. You don't know what they're going through. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, pray for your enemies, those that persecute you and do you wrong. Well, Lord, it doesn't seem like my prayer is working. Well, it may just keep your, be keeping your spiritual attitude and heart right. I've come to learn that the greatest trap for pulling people away from their walk with God is unforgiveness. It opens the door to all kinds of other errant beliefs and behaviors. Offended people produce much fruit, much fruit such as hurt, anger, outrage, jealousy, resentment, strife, bitterness, hatred. The most effective way for the enemy to blind us, and that's what he likes to do is blind us, is to cause us to focus on ourselves. Often those that are offended don't even realize they're trapped. Jesus said, it's impossible that offenses don't come. You know that Greek word for offenses is literally means a stick that holds that trap device up where the food's in there to attract the animal, to lure them in. And you know, the devil's a master technician at putting out something that looks good, smells good, sounds good. And all, all the time, all he wants to do is get you in this little cage. And all you got to do is hit that stick and guess what? That cage drops and you're limited. Your progress stops. Many people are unable to function properly in their calling because of their wounds and hurts and offenses that have been caused in their lives. They are handicapped and hindered from fulfilling their full potential. We must be prepared and armed for offenses. Jesus said they're going to come. 
We have to be prepared and armed for them, ready. Remember what he said, take heed, be observant, be on watch. Because our response determines our future. There are two categories of offended people, those who perceive that they've been offended and those that have actually been hurt. Some things are said even from the pulpit that are misunderstood or misinterpreted. Some things may be said in the counseling sessions that are taken out of context. You may have walked by somebody and not said hi, and it could have been an offense that occurred, right? And there's legitimate people that have been hurt, that have been wounded, that have been betrayed. But regardless, God wants you to let it go. God wants you to forgive. He wants you to overcome with compassion. You may say, well, you don't know what they did to me. What did Jesus do for you? You want to experience true freedom, true wholeness. As long as you har uh, harbor that in your heart, you'll never reach your full potential. Trials in life will expose what is in your heart. Whether the offense is toward God's or others, tests either make you bitter towards God and others, or they'll make you stronger. If you pass the test of offense, your roots will go down deep stabilizing your future. If you fail and become offended, it can lead to bitterness. Medical doctors and scientists have found out uh, that unforgiveness and bitterness is actually linked to certain diseases in life, such as arthritis and cancer. Perhaps the greatest root cause for the absence of emotional rest in our society is fractured relationships through unforgiveness and offense. If we don't deal with our unresolved conflicts, they will deal with us. You need to reconcile relationships. Broken relationships are a razor across the artery of the spirit, which means you'll be bleeding out, hemorrhaging. You know, the life's in the blood. If you're cut and you don't heal that wound, you're going to die. And offenses will take you out slowly and methodically. You'll get harder and harder and harder as time passes. I know I've been going to the marriage covenant a lot, but this is how divorce happens. You get offended with your spouse, right? You don't forgive. And there's many other relationships. An employer to an employee, can, an offense can occur. I, we could go over multiple different scenarios. But as a real man and a real strong woman of God, we need to deal with it. True reconciliation is the most powerful of all human interactions. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15, verse 15 B. Watch out that no bitterness takes roots among you for it springs up. It'll cause deep trouble, hurting many in their spiritual lives. What's bitterness? Bitterness is actually unchecked, undealt with, unforgiveness. Something may have happened five years ago and you never forgave. And it was so minute at that time, but you just let it go and let it grow until it became a root. A root's different. I got a weed in my backyard right now. It looks like a small tree. I got to deal with that thing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. If I would have plucked it, you know, six months ago, it was small. Well, what I do, I continue to let it grow. And now it's a little bit harder to pull out. But by the grace of God, you can still pull it out. Let me go over a few more scriptures as we close. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 through 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. What's the Bible say? Be angry, but what? Do not sin. God made you with emotions. Guess what? You're going to just get plain upset sometimes. I got upset this morning on the way to church, and it was my fault. It was actually Pastor Brandon's fault. <laughs> he was texting me about something that was going on, and I'm at a stoplight, and uh, I'm looking down at the text message. The next thing I know is, beep, 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 beep. The light had obviously turned green, and the guy knew I was on looking down at my phone. I tried not to be one of those people. So my flesh was like, oh, I want to beat back right now. I want to beat back. 
I turn the corner and self-control, self-control. I got over in the other lane, nice and slow. Let them pass. Keep a great distance knowing that I don't want to, I'm not going to get on his bumper. I'm going to let, let this person know I'm well with you. You're obviously in a hurry. I understand I made a mistake, but I was angry, but I did not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, right? It says if you do that, you give place to the devil. Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. So how did Christ forgive you? Listen to what Jesus said, because Paul says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Well, how did Christ forgive us? Look at Luke chapter 23. Verses 33 through 34 says, when they had come to the place called Calvary, so this is Jesus getting ready to be crucified on the cross. It said they crucified him there. Criminals, one on the right, one on the left. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Most people want to call down fire or vengeance when they're being unrighteously persecuted or put to death. But Jesus said, what? Forgive them. They don't know what they do. Mark chapter 11, verses 22 through 26. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, and when I saw this, man, there's sometimes we have a mountain of offense in our way. You can't think right. You're like, how am I gonna get around this? You don't even know why you're so frustrated or disappointed, but it's like a mountain. Jesus said, say to the mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe that those things you say will be done and you'll have whatever you say. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And then he goes on to say, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, if you, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them that your father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, Neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Can you imagine you can limit God's power in your life because you choose not to forgive? Galatians chapter 5, verse number 6 says this, In Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Why is forgiveness so important? Because faith works through love. And if you don't forgive, that means you're in a place of anger or hatred towards somebody. And that means it's limited your faith, which means your prayer life's not effective. It's like a, it's like a downward spiral in your spiritual walk. Man, why are my prayers being answered, Lord? Well, I told you, you need to forgive others. And then, but Lord, you don't know what they did. I told you to forgive others. It's not an invitation, it's a commandment. Once you do that, man, the windows of heaven are opened up again, right? To have received the love of God, because faith works through love, to have received the love of God is to both be armed and disarmed at the same time. What I mean, to receive the love of God, you got the power of the kingdom for you, but you're also disarmed with offenses. Those things don't control you. They've been dismantled in my life. Pastor Earl used to talk about, uh, you know, buttons. You can, there's certain people, you know, that you could push their buttons and we need to dismantle. So love arms and disarms at the same time. No weapon is more powerful. Love is the only medicine which when used according to directions and by obedience, takes one's life away only to find it again in Christ, whole and well. The love of God is outlined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses four through eight, and it cannot be taken on human terms, but only God's terms. Yet God's love is the ultimate healer of all and the driving motivation for our kingdom assignment.